Thanks, Nicole. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our State Library virtual event today. Um, talking about creative writing with Catherine Jordan. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit of background information about Catherine first. Um, Catherine Jordan is the author of the horror novel Seeking Samuel and the Bookseller Secret. She edits and writes in different genres and has been featured in a variety of anthologies and online publications. Catherine has been a judge for the Bram Stoker Award and for the ITW Award. She also facilitates writing courses and critique groups. Catherine lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and five children. Her uh, books are available um, at Sunbury Press, Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and through her website, which is CatherineJordan.com. Um, so right now I'd like to introduce Catherine and hear a little bit about her writing process. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Kathy. Um, so the writing process, the writing process is a fun thing. Uh, I always tell everybody for me, it's a passion. Um, I don't write to make money. Um, it's a nice thing to do, but for me, it's a passion I write because I always feel like I'm compelled to write. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you all an introduction to creative writing. Um, so I've been on both sides of the writing process. I do, um, I am a contributing writer to the Bird Magazine. Um, so that's nonfiction. And uh, I also write for a business website and Facebook page, Sans Honey, also nonfiction. Um, and then in the process, I have to flip back and forth between the nonfiction business side also to the fiction side, which I love. So currently I've been published in um, 10, print anthology collections, various things online as well. Um, I've got my third novel finished. It's being shopped right now. So me telling you that, it's just me saying that, you know, I've, I've worn both, both hats. I have to flip back and forth between the two. So basically, um, the idea here is how do we flip back and forth when we want to write, whatever it is that we're writing, whatever genre we want to go into, how do we flip back and forth between our nonfiction and our fiction, especially when it comes to creative writing. Well, the first thing I want to touch on is what we call the warm up. So think of sports, any sports. Let's let's talk about baseball for a second. So you've got your baseball um, pitcher out there and he's, you know, doing his exercises. He's stretching. He's rolling his arm. Uh, what's he doing? He's warming up. He's warming up for the pitch. We don't do that in fiction. There is no warm up in fiction. When you are beginning to write your story, they always say the best advice is to start in the middle. But how do you know where the middle is? Well, you don't. That's part of the editing process. But what I do like to tell people is when you're writing, get everything on page on the page. So all this advice I'm going to give you right now, the best thing that you're going to take away from this is one, write your story, two don't be boring. That's the best advice I've ever heard. So just write, get it on the page, and then allow the editing process to take over afterward. So this is kind of uh, when me telling you how to flip back and forth between the nonfiction and the fiction. I'm just giving you all these great things to keep in mind, but the focus is always on write it down. Write, write, write. So again, no warm up. Try to go, try to start right in the middle. Start with action. Something is happening. Um, no info dump. What is an info dump? In other words, you're setting up the scene. Again, this is the warm up. Uh, you're telling us everything we need to know uh, about your character. You're vomiting up everything about them, who they are, what they've done. We don't need to do that right now. You want to scatter pertinent information like pepper, like you would scatter pepper on a meal. Okay, you want to scatter that pertinent information throughout your story. Um, no backstory, kind of like an info dump. So the backstory is, you know, okay, your character is 23 years old, she's a female, and now um, you vomit up on the page everything about her past, because this is going to be important for the future of your story. Yes, it, it may, but again, you don't want to dump this right on the first few pages, or right within the first few uh, paragraphs, if it's a short story. Again, this is stuff we weave into the action of the tale. 
don't tell us what you're going to tell us. That's nonfiction. In fiction, you just go right into the story. You don't tell us what you're going to tell us. Start telling us. And you don't summarize your scene. A summarization is not necessary. Write each scene so that it leads logically to the next. So yes, you can have a cliffhanger at the end of your scene, or you can reveal something at the end of your scene. Reveal something that you're getting ready to explore in your next scene. Each scene must have a goal. What does your character want? Something has to happen. Your character has to want something. That's really at the heart of every fiction story. The very first thing we should see on a page is what your character wants, whether it's love, power, um, money, revenge. We need to see that right within that first page. And show emotion. We want to cry along with your character. We want to laugh with your character. We want to be angry with your character. If your character wants revenge, we want to root for your character to get that deserved revenge. And then use all five senses. We want to see the rose. We want to touch its silky petals. We want to smell its musky fragrance. We want to hear the leaves rustle and we want to taste its delicate sweet flavor. By the way, roses are edible. All roses are edible. And you want to stay within one point of view. What is a point of view? The point of view is whose story is this? Whose eyes are we seeing the story through? Who are we following as we continue along in turning the pages in your book or in your story? Um, it can be first person, so you can use the pronoun I. Second person, you, which is not often done. Third person, he or she. So think about whose head you're in and you wanna embody that character. You are the actor as you're writing. You are, if your character's name is Joan, you are Joan. You are not the author writing about Joan, you are Joan. You wanna channel Joan, who she is, what she does. And that's kind of the personification that you want in your head as you're writing. Um, all books, in my opinion, are a mystery. You turn the page to find out what's going to happen, right? We want to find out whether or not this character is going to attain their quest. So I've said that all stories have to have a quest, but we're not supposed to find out until the end whether or not they have attained that quest. This is what we call the plot engine. A plot engine is going to keep your reader reading. It's the initial suspense of the story. So it's your, basically you setting up the quest and now the engine is running. This is the plot. Ooh, okay, this person wants money. That's your quest. The, the plot engine is gonna keep us chugging along through your story to find out whether or not they get the money. Now your job as the writer throughout this entire story is to keep them from getting what they want until the end of your story. Until like that last, I would say between last five and last 10% of your story. Either allow them to get what they want or don't allow it. So you would call that the resolution. The resolution which comes at the end is whether or not your character gets what they want. But again, it's in the last 10% of your story, the whole part of your story, the rise and the fall, like an arc, okay, like a bell, that's you keeping your character from getting what they want. Um, without it, no one will finish reading. Because once you've given your character what they want, that's the end of the story, and they really don't need to continue reading anymore. So this is kind of a mystery, right? Because we don't know exactly whether or not your character is gonna get what they want. Um, you can have this in all kinds of genres too. So it's not just a mystery a genre. It can be a romance. Will he get the girl? Will they kiss at the end? Will they fall in love and run, and run away off to never let, never land? Of course, there's mysteries and horror. What is the terror? And where will it lead? How will it end? And a thriller, who, we have the who, we have the how, will he or she save the day? 
For example, in Harry Potter, here's a mystery. What is that scar on his head? What's it mean? What's it about? Uh, in fantasy, we have a mystery. Think about Lord of the Rings. Will Frodo destroy the ring? So again, we wanna create suspense through our quest. If you think about Lord of the Rings, that quest is opened up pretty early, first scene, first few pages of the novel. Gandalf is on the scene, he finds the ring, and now Frodo throughout the entire book has to destroy this ring. But it's delayed. Again, that's your plot engine. The plot engine, chugga, 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 going through your book, Tolkien's book, will Frodo destroy the ring? It's delayed. You don't find out until the very end. It took three movies, right? If you watch the movies to see whether or not Frodo was successful. That was delayed by using pressure. All kinds of things kept happening to Frodo and to his friends who were carrying along with him throughout the story. We want to keep our characters from getting what they want, no matter what it is. Uh, I'm gonna to touch on another thing. Um, if anybody out there watches Frasier, I love Frasier. And one of my favorite episodes is called The Innkeepers. So this is a comedy, right? So here's the mystery in our comedy. Here's the delay, the suspense within this comedy. This particular episode, it's from 1995. It's called The Innkeepers. I, I show this episode, I have it on a desk and I show this episode in my classes. Um, the idea within this uh, short, uh, The Innkeepers is when the brothers hear Seattle's best restaurant is closing, they buy it and opening night is a blast. So the idea here is Frazier and his brother Niles, they, this restaurant is closing, they wanna buy it and they're gonna make it a success. They're bound and determined to own this restaurant and make it a success. That's their quest. That's what they want to do. Now we're watching this 25 minute episode and we're watching everything happen. Everything is thrown at them. Literally everything. Cherries, smoke, eels, uh, complaints, critics show up. Everything is keeping them from getting what they want, from making that restaurant a success. And if you watch the episode, I promise you will laugh and you will, you will watch it throughout the end because that plot engine is going through, keeping you watching to see whether or not they're successful in making Seattle's restaurant a success. So how do we do that? Okay, it sounds complicated. So how do we, how do we just do all this? There's, there's gotta be a way to do it. I like to write what's called a premise. So what is a premise? A premise is what your story is about in one sentence. Well, I don't know what my story is gonna be about. Okay, that's fair. Um, but you've got to have something in mind, I would think, when you sit down and start writing. So maybe you've decided you wanna write something about your hometown, or you wanna write about something that happened to you the other day, or you've got this little bit of a story in your head and it's just not quite flushed out yet. So this is how we go about flushing that out. It saves you a lot of time um, when you're writing and it also can help trigger writing points for you. So a premise, it's a short sentence about what your story is about. It helps you articulate what you want to write. Um, I do on my website, katherinejordan.com, there is an exercise on there for doing a premise, but I'm just gonna run through it for you a little bit here. So first of all, when we're setting up our premise, the first thing we have to have is a character, okay? We have to have one, at least one person to make a short story, preferably two, your protagonist and your antagonist. Okay, so you wanna set that up first, write those down. Who's my character? Who's my protagonist? Who's my antagonist? Quest, what does my character want? If you have no quest, you have no story. You, you just don't, they have to want something. Okay, and then we have what's called, uh, this may or, not, may or may not be a term you've ever heard before. I call it a deficiency. For example, let's talk about Lord of the Rings again. We have this character called Frodo. So Frodo is a hobbit. Hobbits are youthful, they are innocent, they uh, are short, they have big feet and um, they're very ignorant of a lot of things that are going on in the world because they live in this nice little place called the Shire. It's this perfect little homey town. However, our hobbit friend Frodo 
is the one being chosen to destroy the ring. So Frodo's deficiencies are, how is this little guy, this hobbit, who's little, who is innocent, who knows nothing of the world, who uh, thinks everything is happy, happy, joy, joy. How's this guy supposed to come against ring rates, wizards, goblins, orcs, and destroy a ring? Travel all across, leave his shire where few hobbits ever do, leave the shire, travel across Middle Earth, and throw this ring that supposedly can't be destroyed into Mount Doom. That's quite a task. That's his deficiency. Okay, his deficiency is his stature, where he's from, who he is, his innocence. All right, pressure. Well, we've already touched about all the pressures that keep him from getting what he wants. Um, but these pressures are gonna intensify. If you've ever watched Lord of the Rings or read the book, you'll see that it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder for Frodo to get what he wants to destroy the ring. If you watch Frasier's The Innkeepers, it keeps getting harder and harder and harder for Niles and Frasier to make this restaurant's opening night a success. There is going to be a final conflict when we get towards the end of your book. The final conflict is when your character just can't take it anymore. You have thrown so much pressure at your character, your main character, the characters whose quest we are following throughout this book. You've thrown so much pressure at them that they just can't take it anymore. And something has to happen. And that something is the driving force that's going to allow them to get what they want or fail at getting what they want. That's the something that has to happen. The final conflict with Frodo would be when he is at Mount Doom and he goes to put on the ring, okay? He goes to put on the ring, he's being attacked by Gollum. Um, in The Innkeepers, you haven't really watched it, but I would say their final conflict, uh, it's going to happen towards the end and there is a bit of an explosion and it involves cherries. And I would say that is the final conflict when they literally just can't take it anymore. And a decision has to be made. And then you have your resolution, which is in your final pages uh, or your final paragraphs where the character makes the decision and says, I, and I've gotten what I want or I failed at what I've wanted. So I write a premise and writing a premise, we touch on all of these issues. Once again, it's character, quest, deficiency, the pressures, the final conflict and the resolution. I recommend writing each one of these things down in a list and then writing a sentence out, one sentence that describes what your story is about. If you can't do that right at the beginning, then I recommend you do that in the middle of your story. So once you've gotten about halfway through your story, then that is the time, if you weren't able to do it in the beginning, to write the premise. Once again, tell me your character, your quest, their deficiency, a pressure, more pressures, the final conflict and the resolution, what you think the final conflict would be at this point, the resolution. If you have already written the premise, Again, once in the middle of your book, this would be a great time to rewrite it. Go back, take a look at it. At it. Is it going where you thought it was going to go? It's okay if it changes. There's not a problem with that. Mine changes all the time. I'll start off with a premise and write, and it turns out as I'm halfway through my creative process, guess what? It's nowhere near where I thought it was going to be. And the reason why that happens is because your characters, the decisions they make, will sometimes help drive where your pressures go. So for example, your character wants something, you're doing your best job to keep them from getting what they want. And then maybe along that path, instead of going the straight line, they've taken the left line. I always like to say they've taken that left turn at Albuquerque. That's a Bugs Bunny quote, <laughs> the left turn in Albuquerque. Um, so they're going off on a different line. They're going off on a tangent and that's okay. That's your book. It's all right that they do that. But that's why this in the middle is a great time to either start writing your premise if you haven't done so, 
or tweak your premise. Now, let's say you've finished your book. Yay, the book's done, or the short story, or whatever piece of fiction you're writing, it's complete. Once again, write your premise. So you want to see, again, who your characters are, what their quest is, their deficiency, the pressures, the final conflict, and the resolution. If by the end of your story, you have not successfully articulated a premise, your reader won't be able to read your story, okay? Your reader probably won't read your story. If you can't articulate it through a premise, your reader is not going to be able to understand it as they read. So at the end of your story, at the end of your book is really when you wanna get that premise finalized. You wanna be able to sit across from somebody while you're sitting down and having coffee with them and tell them succinctly what your story is about. And then you wanna hear that person go, oh yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. I'd like to read that. That's a premise. Uh, in Hollywood, they actually call that a when statement. Um, in book writing, novel writing, they, they do call that a premise. Sometimes they'll call it a hook. They can often call it an elevator pitch. They can also call it a blurb. There's all kinds of different ways to describe this premise that I've just been talking about. And again, um, if this is something that you wanna uh, see more about, just go to my website, kathleenjordan.com. There's a page on there. There's a link that'll take you right to an exercise and some information on the premise. So I do have uh, a couple recommended ways also to improve your writing. Let's say that you're just a novice here, you're getting started and you're thinking, how, how do I tackle becoming a good writer or a better writer? Uh, first thing is read, read, read. Read everything you get your hands on. If you like romance, read your romance. Uh, if it's thrillers, if it's horror, read good writing, read bad writing, read short fiction, read essays about your fiction, um, read stories you find on the internet. Reading is the best way to learn to be a good writer because your favorite writers are pretty much setting up the path for you. This is how I did it. You can study this and find and go from there. Um, study your favorite books. I also say to um, take and read bad writing. Okay, if you find something that's awful, well, what was it about it that you didn't like? Was it the grammar? Uh, was it that they took too long to get to the point? you didn't like the characters. These are things that will teach you finding, looking at what you don't like about bad writing is gonna teach you what to focus on in good writing. So that's the next thing I would recommend. Besides reading is writing. Write, write, write. If you wanna be a writer, there's only one way to do it. Write. Um, I recommend writing, if it's your passion, if it's something you love to do, about 500 words a day. That's really not much. It's about a page and a half. Um, and there's many ways that you can do this. You can keep a journal. You can write book reviews just for yourself. You know, if you don't want to publish them anywhere, pick up a journal and just review the latest book you read. Um, rewrite your favorite story in the form of what we call fan fiction. Uh, you can sign up for daily prompts online through various writing websites. They'll send you a prompt today and you can write about that. Um, you can write scenes. You've got a book or story in mind, but you don't know where to go. Pick a scene, write a scene within that story. You know, you know you want this to happen, but you're not sure how you want it to happen. Write the scene, write the scene about it happening. Write about something, again, journaling, write about something that happened that day, somebody you passed by on the street, um, something funny that one of your children may have done. Next thing I recommend is joining a group. Join a writing group, whether that be a critique group or an online writing group or an in-person writing group, they are everywhere. They're in person. In fact, I have one coming up at the Fredrickson Library. Registration is going on. Uh, it started August 1st. It's free. Um, it's going to be Tuesday evenings. It starts at about 6.30. Again, just call the Fredrickson Ri Library and you can sign up. So join a critique group, learn how others see your writing. You never get a ch second chance to explain to your readers. You'll see good and bad writing. You'll get feedback, you'll give feedback. 
And you'll learn more by critiquing and by reading other people's writing. I also recommend attending writers' conferences. I attend several of those. Um, writers' Digest, Pen Writers, the International Thriller Writers. Some of them are free, some of them charge a nominal fee. I sign up for writers' newsletters. They're always free. They're emails. They come in the form of a snail mail too, like in a little packet. Um, I'm gonna recommend some. Pen Writers, Hope Clark, Writers' Digest, Freedom with Writing, Authors Publish, and Career Authors. So those are a few newsletters and things you can sign up for. Um, there's lots of books on writing that are out there. You know, you've taken the first step right here by coming and attending this Zoom, trying to learn about how to write fiction and getting into the mind of your character and, and, and write that piece. Um, you can pick up books on creating characters. You can pick up books on writing specific genres such as horror and romance. Believe it or not, all these genres, they kind of do have a formula. Um, and if you pick up some of these books, they'll go right to that formula and say, okay, girl meets guy, girl loses guy, girl gets guy. You know, it can be very simplistic formulas, but they want to see those formulas. They want to see those points touched upon as you're writing. And it helps because it, shows you where to go and how to, how, where to focus your energies as you're writing. Um, the elements of style. So I've got a few of these books right back here. This is William Shrunk and Wright. It's called The Elements of Style. This is a basic book that really hits well on grammar issues. Um, and it just, it kind of does map out certain things when it comes to writing. And it's a little itty bitty book. It's not very big. And it's again, it's called The Elements of Style by Shrunk and White. There's another great book here. It's called The Secrets of Story. These are some of my favorites. Um, this, The Secrets of Story, it's by Matt Bird. It's tools for perfecting your story writing. There's just so much out there on how to write. And again, there, I can't tell you any more than write, 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 write. Okay, are there any questions? Um, I see it's almost 1230, so I kind of wanted to open it up. I know you all are on your lunch hour, so I just wanted to open up and see if there were any more questions going. Hey, if anyone um, wants to add questions into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself since we're a small group here, we can unmute. Um, I had one for you, uh, Kathy. Um, so you write in different, different genres, like completely opposite genres in my mind, like horror books and then Berg magazine articles. So do you find it hard to switch in between like modes and are you writing concurrently or do you like write one thing and then stop and then write another thing and stop? Um, so uh, do I find it hard to switch back and forth? I, I don't only because I've, I, I've been writing for a long, 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 long time. I don't find it difficult to switch modes. Um, how do I get into the head of my horror? Let's say I need to switch modes. I've been writing, um, I've been working on, let's say romance, you know, or something funny. And now I need to switch. Um, what I will do is I will pick up one of my favorite horror books and I'll just read a chapter or two of that book to try to get me into the zone. And then I go right to my writing. That's how I switch modes. Uh, I've learned that that's what works for me. Everybody has their own, some people do it with music. They'll, they'll switch music. They'll go from listening to something classical to something hard rock. Um, that's how I switch. Uh, when it comes to writing articles, that's, that's kind of easy for me because it actually it's easier for me than fiction because I just take all the, just get rid of all the adjectives, you know, and just feel, you know, focus on the point. This is the point. This is what we want to know. Um, and then what was what was the other part of your question there? So that's how I that's um, yeah. I was I wondered if you like when you when you are working on something, do you do you write that alone and then go to the next one, or are you writing concurrent things at the same time? I'm usually not writing anything concurrently at the same time unless I happen to be in a class. For example, I've been working on my third novel, which is finished. It's in the editing process, 
But while I was finishing up that novel, I was taking a, I, I do writing classes all the time. All writers do. Anybody who's a professional writer or likes to write, they're constantly taking classes or giving classes. So I took a writing class that uh, went over six weeks and every week we had to write a short story, a complete short story, 2000 words. So I was working on that concurrently. Um, but that's that's not all the time. Usually if I'm working on my novel, I'm pretty much I'm, I'm into it and I'm going to keep chugging along until it's finished. Um, Marla had a question. How did you choose a publisher for your books? OK, how did that's a good question. And I actually I get that question a lot. So um, a lot of times publishers. So, OK, horror is what I like to write. So the first thing we do is research as a writer. Who publishes horror? How do we get this piece of horror published? So that's just basically a good Google search. And uh, yes, it requires a lot of research. It's time consuming. I always tell people writing is an art, publishing is a business. Once you've written that piece, whatever you've written, that, that job is over. Now you try to get it published. So I just, I did a lot of research. Um, looking for an agent right now that's what i'm doing right now is looking for an agent for my third book and that's a lot of work too it's just it's googling people and then once you find somebody who you think is a fit then you do a little research on that actual company okay so sunbury press uh has published quite a bit of my work how did i find them i actually i met them through another friend so that one came from word of mouth i was in the middle of doing research and I had touched on Sunbury Press and found something from them. And a friend happened to mention them to me while I was doing my research. And she kind of set me up with a good word and I reached out for them. And that was how I got that through. So that was how I found that publisher. So research is one way. Um, word of mouth is another, You know, being friends with other writers, uh, other writers who are published when you join writers groups, you'll, you'll come across some of those published writers. Um, online critique groups too, you can come across a lot of those published writers. Um, and also going into your books, your favorite books that you like to read, look on the back of those pages, the acknowledgements where they you know, thank all the people that helped them get their work done. There's almost always an editor or an agent or you know, the publisher themselves uh, who they'll thank. And if they're thanking them, they loved them. You know, they helped them. They were a great help to them. So those are the three ways. So research, um, talking to other people, word of mouth, and looking in the backs of your favorite books. Those are great suggestions. Um, I, have you always wanted to be a writer? I know you said um, that you've been writing for a really long time. So can you tell us a little bit about like your personal history with that? Sure. Um, yes, I've always wanted to be a writer. In fact, it's one of the things that I, I kind of, I should have been a teacher. I was a finance major and uh, never really did anything with finance. I wound up in retail, but all my life really, as far as I can remember, I have always been writing. I used to write short stories when I was a kid. Uh, I wrote short stories when I was in grade school and used to read them to my class. When I was in college, I was writing on my first novel. <clears throat> Um, uh, also I was writing, I wrote for the Penn State Business Newsletter. And then once I graduated, I continued to write. It was always a passion of mine. I honestly did not get published though, uh, as far as novel writing. I kind of did it backwards for most people. I got my first book published. And then from there, I started publishing short stories and anthologies and then started publishing articles and then started being a facilitator. So it was kind of weird. I, I really went uh, backwards. Um, and, you know, everybody's transition into writing is going to be different. And that's not to say that just because you've always wanted to be a writer or didn't always want to be a writer, you can't be a writer now. You know, people write, good successful writers write because they love it. Uh, I was reading a thing about, I think it was John Grisham and uh, the, he's an attorney. So he, writing was his passion. So before he was ever published or ever famous or making money, he wasn't going to quit his day job. So what did he do? He would come home from work, have dinner with his family and go right downstairs and write from like 10 o'clock at night until one, two o'clock in the morning and then get up and go to work the next day. So if it's not a passion for you, you know, 
that's okay. It can be a hobby. It can be whatever you want. But for those of you who want it to be passion, you know, who love writing, that's really the best way to do it is to write. But uh, yeah, so I've always been writing. I always write. Every single day I write. I either journal or I'm working on my next novel or I'm writing a short story or I'm involved in um, a writing class or I'm editing. Uh, I do a lot of editing. I, I edit for another publisher. I, uh, I edit, I, I, do, I mentor three different writers. So uh, there's, there's lots of little things that I've got my sticky fingers in. So writing for me is a constant thing. I, I've been writing all my life. Very cool. So my next question is specifically about your horror, um, horror novel. What scares people the most? I would say what scares people the most is um, being vulnerable, okay, vulnerability and isolation. So those are the two things we as horror writers, uh, and remember I said that um, uh, romance writers, mystery writers, genre, uh, genre writers, they all kind of all have their, their structure, their, their magic touching points with, I would say with horrors and thrillers and mysteries, it's vulnerability and isolation. If you can take your character and make them vulnerable right from the beginning and somehow isolate them, for example, let's, uh, the movie Aliens, right? How are they isolated? They're on a ship out in, the, out in space. They're isolated. How are they vulnerable? They got this alien creature on their ship that they know nothing about. So, so that's what scares me. That's what scares me. And that's what I try to touch on in all of my writing, being vulnerable and being isolated. Do you have a favorite author or several authors? I do. I have, I have a couple of favorite authors. So I have them right up here on my uh, thing right now. So um, Helen Yo-Yo Mai, uh, she it writes some good, uh, strange, dark fiction. Uh, Ira, Ira Levin, I love Ira Levin, like the Stepford Wives. If you've ever read the Stepford Wives versus watching the Stepford Wives, the book, The Stepford Wives is very, very creepy, super creepy. Um, Alma Katsu, I love, love, love her writing. Um, let's see, uh, you know, of course I, I can say Stephen King, but he, he's written a lot and I can, honestly, there's a few of his books that I love. I don't love all of them. Um, another one of my favorite authors is, um, uh, I'm looking at her books right now. Uh, so, uh, oh, uh, Julian Flynn. I'd lost her name for a second, Jillian Flint. Uh, so famously she was Girl Gone, but she's written other books and other short stories. I can't get enough of her. I love Jillian Flint. Very cool. Nicole wanted to know, how do you motivate yourself to write? Um, motivation for me is kind of, you know, I'm lucky I've got this space that I'm sitting in right now. Um, it's my place, it's my space where I go to do my writing. I think that's really the biggest thing. I get asked that question a lot too in my writing classes. How do I motivate myself? Make a space, whether it be a small spot in your bedroom or your office or a, a little niche in your kitchen, somewhere where A, you're not gonna be disturbed because that's the biggest thing that keeps people from writing is being disturbed and life just gets in our way you know life gets in the way of everything so have a space where you can write without being disturbed have a space where you have your things laid out and ready to go you've got your notebook out there you've got your laptop out there you've got pens or pencils um you've got little quotes sitting up and pinned uh for you to read and take a look at that's how I get motivated. You know, I walk into this space, I see my writing stuff all set up, I can shut the doors, nobody's going to bother me, and I write. Does anyone else have any questions here? This was great advice for us all. Um, anybody that does any sort of creative writing or even non-creative writing when you have to write stuff for your job or whatever, there's a lot of helpful um, tips that you gave us just for you know the mundane <laughs> writing that we have to do. Um, I'm going to put a link in for Cumberland County Libraries for the workshop. So if this was sort of wet anybody's whistle and wants to learn more or hear more from Catherine, um, this writer's workshop sounds like a really cool um, thing that's going on for the next 
it goes through from September into October, right? Correct. And like I said, it's totally free. If you go to register and for whatever reason it's uh, filled up, uh, you can reach out to me personally and I'm the one that facilitates it so I can see about getting um, you in. Uh, and you can, you can reach out to me through my website uh, or Kathy at KatherineJordan.com. I see some more questions popping yeah. up. So I can, yeah, I can look at them. Okay, so how do you not be afraid of being a bad writer? Well, I don't think anybody's afraid uh, not afraid of being a bad writer. I honestly, I will, it's, it's so funny because I will start to write something and as I'm writing it, I'm thinking, oh, this is the best, you know, A plus, A plus, A plus. And then I go back and reread it and I'm like, well, this is just absolute garbage. I can't believe I wrote this down. Mm -hmm. um, every, you, there's no silencing the editor in your head. It never happens. I, every writer I know has fears that their writing is awful. Um, we all do that it's it's just it's that's just we're human that's the way we are i th i think even the best writers question themselves and that's why there's editors <laughs> and that's why we join critique groups and that's why we have other people and not your mother not your best friend not your spouse who read our writing be and and that's another thing too you have to have a thick skin if you're going to ask people for feedback you have to embrace that feedback. When somebody is telling you something about your writing, oh, I just didn't get it, or I didn't understand it. That's one thing. And that can make you feel bad. But one of the nice things about joining a writer's group, when you have a writer tell you, they're going to be able to be a little bit more specific. They're not gonna say, I just didn't get it. You'll get something like, well, this character didn't appeal to me because of this. Okay, that's the nice thing about joining a writer's group. You get specific advice that will help you change, uh, make changes that you're able to actually see, okay, this is, this is what's wrong. This is what's going on. But I always think my writing sucks when I write it, always. Uh, I need feedback. I don't trust my own feedback. I'm not, not too many writers do. Again, that's why we have editors. That's why we have agents. That's why we have publishers. Okay, Marla had another question. Do you edit your own writings or do you have someone else edit your writing? Uh, uh, okay, I will, here's the process when it comes to editing. And I think this goes across the board. Your, your project is finished, okay? So now what do you do? You, you finished your product, project. This is, again, it goes back to writing that premise. You write out your premise line. Does it work? Have I touched on all the points I'm supposed to? Then uh, I have a program on my computer called Autocrit, A-U-T-O-C-R-I-T. Some people have one called Grammarly. There's all kinds of them out there. They're editing programs. I will run an editing program on my writing. That editing program will pick out all kinds of things that I never caught. It might pick out redundancies, uh, misspellings, um, homonyms, in other words, something like here and here here H-E-A-R versus H-E-R-E. -E. Okay, those are easy things that spell checker won't catch that a uh, editing engine will. Uh, uh, adverbs or uh, like too many adverbs. Again, redundancies, repetitions, just all kinds of things that something you like your basic computer word uh, program will not catch. I run that. So I do the premise, I run my editing program, then I reach out to writer friends. So what, what we call beta readers, B-E-T-A. So these are readers that are just reading for fun and they're gonna give you very, very basic feedback. They're gonna say, hey, I liked it and here's why, or I didn't like it and here's why. And then you take that feedback. Then um, I also have another editor, which I pay, uh, it's not much. They're wonderful, it's a writing team. And if anyone's interested, I can give them information on this. Um, they go through it and they give me points. Okay, you missed a plot here, or you did this here, or you did that there. And then I'll take that and I work on that. And that takes a long time. So writing something might take me three months. Now I'm talking about a book. A book might take me three, four months to write the book, but it's gonna take me easily another uh, three months minimum to edit it. And then, and only then, when I think it's as perfect as it possibly can be, will I start shopping for an agent or a publisher? Do I edit something on my own and think, oh, this is great, I'm gonna send it in only with a short story? 
I only do that with the short story. And even then I always have somebody else. Yes, I always run it through auto crit. And yes, I always have somebody else, at least one other person read it for me. Um, that length, that lengthy process I just talked about a few seconds ago, that, that's when it comes to novels or longer fiction. Thank you. Any last questions here? Okay, what's the difference between an agent and a publisher? What does each do? Okay, good question. So an agent is going to help you find a publisher. The publisher, okay, so this book um, was published by, so if I go in the beginning here, this pub, this uh, Pearson Education Company, Allen and Bacon, okay, that was the publisher. All books have publishers. You can self-publish your own book. Publishing costs money, okay? So if I publish this book on my own, I have to pay for the cover design, I have to pay for the editing, I have to pay for the pages, I have to pay to actually then buy the book and resell it. That's a self-publisher. An actual publisher does all that for you, okay? They've put the money up, I don't self-publish. I, I do not self-publish. My books are not self-published. I have a publisher. The publisher uh, has uh, the cover designer. They have in-house editors. They have in-house marketing. They get your books on all the websites and get your books into distribution for you. That is the publisher. The agent takes your manuscript. So this here, okay, my manuscript, which I have written in, in a notebook, Okay, they take my manuscript that I, I will have and they'll pitch it to publishing houses. So they will go around to the, the big publishing houses like Simon & Schuster. My agent will go to Simon & Schuster and all these other houses and say, hey, I've got this writer, Kathy Jordan. She wrote this really good book here. I think as the agent heard this really good book, here's her premise and they'll read it. And the publisher will say, oh, hmm, I might be interested in that. And then if the publisher is interested, they say, okay, here, we're gonna pay this writer X amount of dollars and we're gonna buy the book from her. And then the agent makes a percentage of whatever that is and, and gets to keep that. So the publisher is the one putting up all the money to take that book and make it into a book where the agent is the person trying to sell your book for you. Do you need an agent to publish? No, you do not. You do not need an agent. But an agent is a wonderful person who will get you more money. Um, an agent can get you a better publisher. An agent will go through all the legal process for you. Um, and most agents will only take anywhere from five to 10% of whatever it is that you make. That's really not a lot of money when you think about it. Uh, so you don't have to have an agent. It does become a little bit harder. You can, first time around, um, I just went, I tried going through an agent. I had a hard time finding one. It's very difficult to find an agent. Um, so I just went right to the publisher and I got my books published through them. So Sunbury Press is a small publisher. There's a lot of boutique and small publishers out there. They're good publishers. With Sunbury Press, I've never paid a dime for anything I've done. They've been very, very good to me. They are a small press. So why am I going to an agent now? Uh, because it's something different. I really want to get my book into mass market. I would love to see it turned into a movie. And that's probably not going to happen at a small press. So I'm just trying to go for something a little bit bigger. If I fail at going for something a little bit bigger, then I can turn right back to you know somewhere else or I can keep trying. It's just, it's options. So you do not need to have an agent. You do need a publisher. Your book's not getting published without a publisher. You might be that publisher, the self-publisher who puts up all that money to get it published, and people do that. Or, you know, like I said, you can go directly to publishers, just Google them and start doing some research. And um, they'll have somewhere on their website where you can send in your work. Okay, do you have any input on what the publisher decides the cover will look like? Um, for small presses, yes. For big presses like uh, Simon & Schuster, no. Um, the Sunbury Press, uh, but I think both of them, as a matter of fact, they'll send you out a questionnaire. They might ask you, the bigger, the bigger 
presses like again little brown simon and schuster um i'm just trying to think of ones off the top of my head uh they might ask you know what were your thoughts but ultimately in the end they're going to do what they're going to do okay they are the marketing professionals and they're not going to rely on us for marketing the smaller presses um you know they they realize that there's they their reach is not as big and so they're more than likely to give you some leeway as far as what your cover will look like so uh with my covers i rejected the first few ideas that they had and um then i think third time was the charm and we wound up agreeing on the on the cover elizabeth asks how do you make sure your work isn't stolen? Well, that's a good question. A lot of people ask that. Most people are not going to steal your work. It, I have even, I was just talking to a professional agent the other day. Um, I was emailing back and forth with her and that was a question that had come up in a Zoom with other people that we were with. And she said, now this agent, she gets a thousand queries a day. She's with one of the bigger uh, New York agencies. And she, according to her, she says she's never seen it happen. So if she hasn't seen it happen, when I tell you it's most probably not going to happen, it's not going to happen. Why? Most people are lazy. They're not going to take the time to steal your idea. They're not going to take the time to steal your idea and, and write it. Okay. So ideas are not yeah, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You can't copyright an idea, okay? You've got an idea out there. Somebody can steal the idea. Look at Dracula. How many different books have been written about Dracula, okay? Thousands, I would say, have been written, but if you go between short stories and books about Dracula. So same idea, you've got a bloodsucker that wants to live eternally, but you've always got a different story. Um, so next question might be about copyrights. The... Um, Every time you write something, once you put it out there, it is copywritten, okay? So whether I share it online, whether it's uh, mailed to somebody, I put it up on a website, I put it up on any form of social media, it is immediately copywritten, immediately. So that protects you there, okay? Because that's just the way the copyright laws work. Uh, I've also heard people take their manuscripts and mail them back to themselves. So there's a postmark on there. That's the poor man's way of getting a copyright. You can actually, you yourself, you can Google it and you can get a copyright, uh, you know, from the, from the government. You can do that with your book too. But I would say in the long run, it is not necessary for those of you who are writers. You do not have to fear somebody stealing your work. A sentence or two, that happens um an idea maybe but once again i wouldn't fear somebody stealing your idea there's just they're going to write a different story if they take your idea so what are you working on right now good question right now i am working on um finishing the edits on my third novel i said well, i'm shopping agents right now and um so i just took a class uh, a writing class with this particular agent I'm looking at and she and I she hasn't agreed 100% yet to take me on but she's been going back and forth with me to I think kind of to see what I'm willing to do and um, how far I'm willing to go uh, so hopefully that's going to work out that's my big project right now also my facilitating course which is coming up uh, I just finished my class on all the, the six short stories so now that though I've, I've got a portfolio of about 12 short stories, so I constantly get um, all kinds of submission um, places where I can submit these short stories. So that's, that's what I, October, this fall is a big time for me. That's when I get a lot of my short spooky stuff out there. So submitting, you know, I've, I've got a nice little portfolio of 12 short stories so I can start submitting, 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 sending things out there and see what we can get published in time for Halloween. That's what I'm working on right now. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Um, again, I posted the link to Cumberland County Libraries in the um, website and also Kathy's um, page, her website, um, for you to get more information. Um, 
and also I know I learned a lot. So thank you very much for um, really introducing me to this. I, I, you know, I'm one of those people that had creative writing classes in college and then never really thought about it again. So this okay. would brought up like some great um, things that, you know, I definitely can use in, in regular day-to-day -day writing. Great, great. Um, There's a lot out there. There's a lot out there online too. One of the, I, benefits I would say of COVID as far as writing goes there's a lot more out there online now than there was before so that's great yeah well thank you again um everyone thanks for joining us today uh this meeting was recorded it will be up on our website and we will share it with you Catherine so you can do whatever you'd like to do with it oh great um, very and um thank you everyone for joining us Have thank you day. thank you